bro. Yeah, he was nice. See, everybody remember him from the Knicks, you know, when he helped win that second championship and everything like that. But I'm talking about when he was with the Bullets down Winston-Salem Stadium before that. Gave him 42 points a game the whole season, 41.6. The whole season. But the Knicks, they put the shackles on him, man. You know, on this whole game, they locked him up like in a straitjacket or something. When he was in the streets of Philly, the playgrounds, ah, oh, he was one of these. You know what they call him? What? Jesus. That's what they call him, Jesus, because he was the truth. Then the white media got a hold of it. Then they got to call him Black Jesus. You know, he can't just be Jesus. He got to be Black Jesus, you know, but still, he was the truth. But that's the real reason why you got your name. You named me Jesus after Earl Monroe, not Jesus of the Bible? Not Jesus of the Bible, Jesus of North Philadelphia. Jesus of the playgrounds. That's the truth, son. The way he dished, the way he, you know, he spin, you know how you do. Coming off, all that. Tow. Hey Earl, how's everything? Everything is good. How about yourself? Good, thank you, thank you. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. No problem. So maybe first I'll uh, quickly introduce myself. I think Eitan told you I'm part of uh, a number of Facebook pages. I administrate a couple pages. Basically, we we built it up. Me and a few other guys. Uh, we have like a few million followers already. So uh, that's that's really cool. Okay. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, posting to these guys and getting in good debates with, uh, you know, a lot of guys on Facebook. Um, yeah, so I also, I wrote a book also on the NBA. I'm a big analytics guy. It's, it's similar to Bill Simmons' book of basketball, if you're familiar with that. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so maybe, uh, maybe we'll just get started because I want to know, I want to learn more about you. So, okay, so first I wanted to ask you, uh, maybe we'll start with your upbringing. Uh, I wanted to ask about, you know, I know you grew up in South Philly, so, you know, I wanted to ask, first of all, is that where you, you picked up your, your street ball style of play? Well, pretty much so. Um, you know, when I came up, uh, you know, we didn't have camps or, you know, other places for, you know, people to teach you the game and such, so where you learn the game was at, on the playground, and, uh, you know, we'd go from playground to playground and play against those guys who were good on the edge of the other Mm -hmm. um, my, in my interest, I didn't start playing until I was 14. Mm -hmm. So it took a little while for me to, you know, get my game, you know, up to par to be able to play on the playground. Mm -hmm. But uh, once it does, you know, started, uh, we had a group of kids in, in, in my playground that uh, were pretty good. And once I was able to play with them, uh, we formed a pretty good team. Mm -hmm. I know in the '60s, like street ball was much more popular than it is today. Like it's a it's a different type of street ball. Like I know in the '60s they'd have these legendary games at Rucker Park. You know, Wilt Chamberlain would show up. Dr. J would make a name for himself. Why do you think it's different today? Like street ball isn't the same. Well, today, you know, you know, you have much more involved as far as uh, organized you know, basketball uh, than back then. And I, and, uh, and I guess one of the most important things is the advent of the, 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 the AAU. Uh, it's interesting that uh, AAU back in, back in the day were teams that um, that uh, vied to go to the uh, Olympics or players on those teams, you know, the Philip those Oilers and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, today, you know, the AAU teams in every city. And... Um, and a bunch of them with that, and, you know, they buy for players. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, the, the street ball is not the same. Uh, you know, you can't get hurt. you got to be seen in certain places. And, they, and, and the traveling is almost like traveling for an NBA team. Because a lot of these teams even travel overseas. Right. 
Do you remember specific games like playing in Rucker Park? Like, do you remember playing like Kareem or Wilt or any of these legends? interesting so let's move on to your nba career maybe i actually posted on one of my facebook pages i told them i was going to be interviewing you so i have a couple questions from them uh so maybe i can read one i wanted to ask you what, what does it feel like to get traded in your prime because i know not necessarily traded but you know lebron is free right now so what do you think is going through his mind you know well chamberlain was trading his prime what, what was it like you know move, wanting to move on to a different team in your prime I saw in your book, uh, this was interesting to me, when you were looking to go to the Pacers, you saw in the locker room that the, the players, they had to protect themselves, so they had, like, weapons on them. So that, I found that interesting that, you know, back then that was even a consideration for you. Like, you wouldn't want to go to a city with racism, you know, as opposed to today, you don't have to worry about that. So, so when you came over to the Knicks, you know, you're going to be paired with uh, Walt Frazier as another ball-dominating guard. So what was going through your mind? Were you a little bit 
nervous going in, or did you think it would go well? Well, I was a little bit apprehensive, to tell you the truth, uh, when I found out that it was predicted, I was hard to, because we had been such, you know, kind of enemies for so long. Um, but uh, the underlying factor of it all was just the knowledge you know, and knowing that, you know, I could play you know, with anyone. Mm-hmm. And the fact that um, I was going to the next, it just let me know that I had to change my game some to accommodate being there. So, I came in with the head that, you know, I wasn't going to be the same player that I was that I was in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. And I think that really helped me out. I mean, even though, you know, it, it, initially I struggled because a lot of times, you know, when you used to be a D guy uh, and then you're not the guy, you know, there are things that you would normally do that you all of a sudden you couldn't do anymore. Absolutely. And, You definitely uh, adapted quickly because within a couple of years of coming to New York, you're you're able to win a championship with that next team in '73. Well, you know, we were we were in a championship that first year that I got it, and I didn't perform that well that, that year. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, the interesting thing about being in, in championships in, in multiple years, and I was there in three consecutive years. One with the fourth, and then two with the the with the Knicks. Mm-hmm. all of a sudden you think this is the way it's going to be forever. And, you know, that's why I tell guys that, uh, that finally get into the playoffs or get into our championship series. You relish the time because you never know if you're going to get back there. Mm-hmm. How do you think uh, you and Walt would play if you guys are in your prime in today's uh, NBA and you're going against all the backcourts in the NBA today? Definitely. And I saw uh, a quote, I think it was from your, maybe from your book or from an interview. Uh, you said that it was a few years ago, but you said you don't see any any one player today who's who reminds you of your game. Do you still say that? Do you still, is there still not a guy out there who reminds you of your game? Maybe we'll move on also a little to your post-playing career. One one question I had from one of the fans is he wanted to know what was it like being a di- diabetic professional athlete, and were there any struggles uh, while you were playing, or maybe that you're struggling from now after you're playing? And also, is this what motivated you to become a spokesman for the American Heart Association? trying to, to get out and tell people, you know, about diabetes and how they can, can 
Definitely. Are you still involved in any way with uh, the American Heart Association or any other any other association that works on bringing awareness to this type of thing? How's the recovery going? It's coming along pretty well. Uh, it's, uh, you know, as you, as, as you, as you get you know, better in one thing, something else starts to happen. So, you know, it's a domino effect. But uh, I'm doing pretty good, and uh, I'm just continuing to uh, work at it. And hopefully in the next uh, month or so, I'll be get out here and, and start moving around a little bit better. Uh-huh. Maybe make a comeback one day? <laughs> Uh-huh. Okay, good. So I know also you're involved with uh, the NBA candy store. So I found that pretty interesting. You know, how, how, what, well, how do you get involved with that? Like, you know, how did the idea pop into your head and you mind talking about what exactly you guys do? Yeah, definitely. It's a good way to get the kids involved already from from an early age. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, you know, it's good and and, it, it, uh, and it's fun, and that's the thing that I like about it. And uh, so you know, it's uh, you know, what can I say? It's, uh, it's a fun thing to do. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, candy is always. We also, I've always liked candy. We've also developed a, a, a sugar-free candy for those. Mm-hmm. Kids. Uh-huh. Yeah, definitely. Um, I saw also on your website you were involved with Reverse Spin Entertainment. Do you mind talking about that? On a day-to-day basis, you're, do you 
you do other things. You're also involved with Reverse Spin, and you do the NBA Candy Store. Is that basically what you do on a day-to-day -day basis now? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, you know, like I said, you know, for the last year, I really haven't been able to do anything. So people have been carrying me on their, on their back for, for, for a good while. But, oh, wow. But, you know, these are the things that I do. Of course, I do so in the time from this to whatnot. I have to speak in the games with the, and appearances and things of that nature. That, uh, you know, those are the things that always, you know, come up and uh, I've been doing those things. Yeah, definitely. Do you wanna at some point maybe go go back? Obviously not to playing in the NBA, but maybe like assist a coach or assistant coach or trainer or anything anything like that. Uh, I think those kind of things have kind of you know you know kind of passed me by at this point. You know, I think obviously you know being involved is always good, and you know like I said, I missed the whole season this year. And, uh, I used to go and I do, you know, stuff in the studio with the uh, MSG for when the Knicks are playing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I missed this whole season, but hopefully I'll get back in to do that the next season. And, uh, you know, and, and as we speak, you know, I forgot one thing about our reverse spin entertainment stuff that we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we also present, um, uh, you know, chefs and things like that. So we've got uh, reality shows that we're and trying to get to uh, different companies and things of that nature to try and do, you know, get out for uh, uh, syndication. So, you know, that's the other thing that we're doing right now. Uh-huh. Are, are you into, like, uh, obviously, I mean, you're a big baller, but, like, are you into today's game specifically? Like, what are your thoughts about today's game as opposed to, uh, you know, the game that you played in? So what do you think about like the one and done? I know Adam Silver is talking about maybe making a two-year requirement. What are your thoughts about that? you this i know this was a big thing on espn and all these you know media outlets i have to ask you about your mount rushmore yeah so l let me tell you this i agree a hundred percent with you and I, you know my father was a big wilt fan 
Uh, he got me very much into Wilt. The main chapter of my book is discussing why I believe that Wilt Chamberlain was the greatest player in NBA history. And I'm, I'm one of those few young guys that, you know, I'm young, but I respect, like, the legends, the guys that played in the 60s, you know, Oscar, Russell, Will, you, of course. <laughs> well, it's, it's a good thing. I mean, it, you know, obviously, you know, it, the game has changed, but the game was built on, you know, guys back in those days. And further back, and one of the things that I, you know, even as a, a guy getting into the league back then, I respected, you know, the guys that uh, had played before me because they really paved the way for me to be, you know, where I was. So. Yeah, I feel like there's no respect <laughs> anymore. No, no, uh, it's not. It, it's not even necessary at this point for our kids to, you know, kids to come up with, you know, the main people are the AAU coaches. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you this: I know in '73 your Knicks beat the Lakers. Um, and you, you you beat Wilt. So, you know, people always say these things about Wilt. You know, he didn't care about losing. You know, he, he whatever, he cared more about stats. Is that really true? Because you beat him in his last game of his career. So, what, what do you remember what he was like that last game? Well, you know, he, he wasn't the Wilt that I had known from before. I mean, obviously, uh, and here's, a, you know, the thing about Wilt, you know, where people think he didn't care about, you know, public sentiment and things of that nature. He's a guy that was scoring, you know, how, whatever how many points he was scoring. And people were saying, well, he's scoring points or whatnot, but that's all he does. Well, they didn't, they didn't count them um, back in the early days. They didn't count block shots. Right. Uh, he blocked a lot of shots. Yeah. He... Obviously, he was, he was a great rebounder. Right. But, Shooting and whatnot, and he decided to lead the league in the sense to let, let people know that he was a world <laughs> player. I mean, a guy that can do that uh, is obviously a, a, a talent, and uh, you know, he proved it in so many ways. I mean, when you think in terms of even his scoring, I mean, he only played about 12, 13 years, right? And, and it took uh, Jabbar, what, 20 years to beat his, to beat his uh, record or something like that? Or yeah. Yep. Wilt would play 48 minutes a game, even. Yeah, 40. How about that? Yeah. How about average 48 minutes a game? <laughs> yeah, 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 it's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Guys, with, guys, guys beat up on him the way that they beat up on it, too. You know, because that was one of the strategies. Beat up on Wilt. Beat up on Wilt. But, uh... There was no other way to stop him. Right? It was, it was something else, and... I remember, I remember someone with the Johnny Green that he was getting ready to dunk the Johnny Green, put his hand up underneath the ball but, as Wilk was getting ready to dunk it. The Wilk decided, he, you know, uh, he wasn't going to dunk it. But then he told Johnny, really, he says, Johnny, don't put your hand in him. Well, uh, the next time, we're going to break it off. You know, he <laughs> you know, was compassionate and he was doing it well. <laughs> Wow. And so let me ask you about this story also. There's a famous story when, when he stuffed Gus Johnson so badly that he dislocated his shoulder. Do you remember that? I don't remember that one. Uh, but I don't remember that. Gus was such a big you know, physical specimen himself. And Gus was, you know, when you first think about guys who were tearing down rims, that was Gus Johnson. When I was in college, and, and there were games that came on the TV that we were able to get down in, in, in North Carolina, I remember Gus jumping out of the corner almost and dunking on Bill Russell. And to me, that was such a great feat that I, and I told the guys, I, I want to play with him. You know, and lo and behold, I was able to do that. Yeah. Wow. So, so if I would say Wilt was the greatest player in NBA history, you wouldn't call me crazy? Uh, like I also I feel like people who lived in the Michael Jordan era like there was a lot of media hype you know and propaganda saying that he was the greatest of all time you know like kind of disrespecting Bill Russell and Oscar and all these guys Wilt these guys in the 60s and 70s that did a lot for the game that paved the way for Michael. Well, yes, but you know Michael did a lot for the game as, uh, as well, and the fact that uh, the 
they did start publicizing it. They, they, they started that was you know stirring the uh, uh, what he wanted to do to try and you know uplift the game. TV contracts, and cable contracts, and other things that they've been doing to expand this into a global you know organization. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, you know that's what it was all about. And you know, unfortunately, we didn't have that type of media back. You know, didn't have. So, so if I ask you greatest of all time, who do you tell me? Will Chamberlain. Really? Wow. Yeah. And then Michael is second? I don't know. You got a lot of guys. I mean, you, got, you, got all, you got so many guys that uh, were, you know, you know, even look at Charles Barkley. I mean, I agree. He was, you know, I think because he didn't win a championship and whatnot, he's not really thought of it the same way. And here's another guy that nobody ever even really talks about as being, you know, such, you know, they know he's a great player, but they never talk about him as such, and he's Rick Barry. Absolutely. I mean, Rick Barry was a, hey, people hate to be come up against Rick Barry. Yeah. <laughs> but what you get is that you get guys who played in the era, they know who were the guys. And, and you know, they keep to talk about other guys and whatnot, but they don't do Yeah, and I'm sure nobody wanted to go up against Wilt. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you know. All right, excellent. Is there anything else you want to add? Say anything about what you're doing now, or or about about this? Uh, I just want I like to, you know the people that you you know reach out to and whatnot. Uh, you go to our website at uh, you know WorkCandyStore.com and you know see what we have and you know. Yeah, I'll definitely, you know, try to bring some awareness to that, and uh, we'll see see what happens. All right, Earl the Pearl, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Take care.